All right, everybody. So uh, next up, we're going to have Grant McCarty of the Bitcoin Policy Institute. And he is here to introduce a very special guest. Give Grant a warm welcome, everyone. Thank you, everybody. I'm proud to announce Robert F. Kennedy Jr. coming up to the stage to be our next keynote speaker. Mr. Kennedy is a renowned lawyer and environmental advocate. He founded the Waterkeeper Alliance in 1999, which is a worldwide coalition of environmental organizations. To date, there are over 350 organizations across over 40 countries as part of the Waterkeeper Alliance. He's the son of Bobby Kennedy Sr. and he's the nephew of John F. Kennedy, former president of the United States. He's a lifelong defender of human rights. He has fought against some of the biggest corporations in the world fighting for what he believes in. And he is a believer in Bitcoin. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is running for president of the United States in 2024 in the Democratic Party. So without further ado, Robert Kennedy Jr. Hello, Bitcoiners. Um, there's a lot of people who are not in this room for whom Bitcoin may seem an issue that's too trivial for a presidential campaign. David Bailey at a party that we were at last night asked me how I got uh, sold on Bitcoin. And I told him that it happened to me in an instant when I saw the truckers, what happened at the trucker strike in Ottawa. And a, a few months before that, I had gone to Italy and I had given a public speech to a large, large crowd in Italy about the dangers of digital currency and particularly programmable currency that could be used by governments to, to enforce, to punish bad behavior in com combination with surveillance systems and facial recognition systems that the government would know when you were doing something wrong and could change your credit card. And this is what's happening in China. So they would only purchase groceries within maybe a five minute walk of your home. And I said that hypothetically, and I think six weeks after I made that speech, I saw that very thing happen to the truckers in, in Ottawa. As most of you know, that trucker strike was a peaceful demonstration of people who were demanding rights that are sacred and are taken for granted for every American. the right to be free of government mandates, the right for free assembly, the right for free speech, uh, the right to petition our government, all of those things that we take for granted. And nonetheless, and it was a peaceful demonstration, nonetheless, the Canadian government fiercely repressed the truckers' protests. Government officials declared a state of emergency they suppressed free speech. Perhaps most alarmingly, they froze the bank accounts of hundreds of protesters and their supporters, which they identified using surveillance and data monitoring technologies. Some of these lawful and peaceful protesters, none of these lawful and peaceful protesters had violated any law. They had not been charged and they certainly had not been convicted. It, but suddenly they found that they could not access their money, their bank accounts, to pay their mortgages or to feed their families. When I witnessed this cataclysm, this, this devastating use of, of government repression, I realized for the first time how free money is as important to freedom as free expression. And... A government that has the power 
to starve its citizens when they're disobedient will inevitably turn our entire country into serfs. It is the ambition of every totalitarian regime to exercise complete control over every aspect of our lives. We live at a time now that technology has dangerously expanded the capacity for governments and corporations to control our lives. Distant, impersonal, multinationals and authoritarian technologies have usurped the realms of human activity that were once private or held by a community. They monitor our every movement, our communications, our every transaction. And the technologies they use to monitor us can also be used to control us. Led by the United States, liberal democracies across the globe suddenly pivoted during the pandemic and used that crisis as an excuse to trample essential constitutional rights and freedoms. Governments suspended the rights to free assembly, the freedom of worship, property rights, trial by jury, and they censored free speech in the name of combating misinformation and disinformation. We lost our freedom to travel. The mandates cost us even sovereignty of our own bodies. Some might say, well, those were just temporary restrictions and temporary suspensions of our rights. But the Constitution has no pandemic exception. And And by the way, the framers of the Constitution knew all about pandemics. There was a malaria epidemic that decimated the armies of Virginia during the Revolutionary War, and a smallpox epidemic that froze the armies of New England at the very time when Benedict Arnold had led the capture of the city of Montreal. And because smallpox had, de uh, had decimated the, that, that force, we were not able to hold Montreal, otherwise Canada today would be part of the United States. And the framers knew that at the time. Not only that, but after the end, between the end of the Revolutionary War and the ratification nine years later of the Bill of Rights, there were epidemics in almost every city in our country. Smallpox epidemics, cholera epidemics, yellow fever epidemics that killed tens of thousands of people. And yet, the framers did not put an epidemic exception in the Constitution. They wrote the Constitution not for easy times, but for hard times. And, and during the Civil War, when we lost 659,000 troops killed in battle on both sides, is the equivalent of 7.2 million today, much a much worse loss than happened in COVID. And our country was being torn apart and came this close to being ripped apart. And when Abraham Lincoln did the right thing and tried to suspend habeas corpus to prevent Confederate infiltrators from inciting riots in the Northern cities, he was told by the Supreme Court, you can't do it. It's in the Constitution. It doesn't matter how bad the crisis is. You cannot suspend the Constitution. And yet, we saw this very, very dangerous precedent that we now have, that we as American citizens are now facing in our country. That happened during COVID, where the government established a new precedent, which is that if it has a good enough excuse the government can now take away all of our freedoms. And guess what? There is always a good excuse, whether it's to stop a new disease, the next pandemic, to protect us from misinformation, to prevent domestic terrorism, to stop hate speech, to prosecute a war, or to fight climate change. But all of these reasons can easily turn into pretexts. Control over the public, starts perhaps as a means, but it always becomes an end. It's part of the unstated and seductive ideology 
of totalitarianism, that utopia will come through exercising perfect control over society. And that works well as long as the good guys are in control or your guys are in control. Bitcoin is a bulwark against precisely this kind of government and corporate expansion and intrusion. In fact, it has been used It has been used to bypass oppressive government controls over the monetary systems, as in Canada and Myanmar. As president, I will make sure that your right to hold and use Bitcoin is inviolable. First, I will defend the right of self-custody of Bitcoin and other digital assets. You should be able to own your own private keys the same as you own the keys to your car or own your wallet. Your wallet, whether it's in your pocket or in your, or in your computer, is your own. I don't think the government has the right to demand access to your Bitcoin key or indeed any of your passwords. To say otherwise is to cede essential territory to the surveillance state. Second, I will, I will uphold the right to run a node at home. <laughs> KYC requirements should be applied at the level of banks and exchanges, not at the level of nodes. Otherwise, Otherwise, it would be, become impossible to run the software. The whole point of Bitcoin is that it's decentralized. Anyone can run a node, and it's important not only for Bitcoin, but for democracy to be decentralized. Third, I will defend use-neutral, industry-neutral regulation of energy. President Biden's, President Biden's 30% tax on energy for Bitcoin miners requires an invasive surveillance apparatus to monitor what is happening in individual computers. It sets a terrible precedent in which everything that you do re that requires electricity must now be monitored by the government. That's why I also support people's rights to refuse smart meters in their homes. Fourth, fourth, I will make sure that the United States remains the global hub of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Major established companies like PayPal, Fidelity, and Block are investing heavily in Bitcoin-related software development. Some of the best engineers and coders in the tech industry work in this field and we want to keep them here in America. I will reverse the government's growing hostility toward this industry and keep innovation at home. That leads to my fifth point. Events like the FTX calamity prove that some kind of regulation of the crypto industry is needed. My administration will consult with knowledgeable people like yourselves, to establish sensible jurisdiction and governance. For starters, we must recognize that Bitcoin is not a security and should, and should not be regulated as such. Bitcoin is in a class by itself. It's wide decentralization. I'm told now that there are 40,000 nodes, prevents a lot of the insider trading, manipulation, and pump and dump schemes that plague other cryptocurrencies. Six, I will carefully consider whether individuals like Ross Ulbrich were prosecuted. I will consider whether they were prosecuted for actual crimes or as a means to crack down on crypto. If they had been unjustly made an example 
I will consider pardoning them, and I will act very quickly to do so. Before I conclude, I'd like to say something about the environmental criticism of Bitcoin. It may be unpopular to say here, but even though those criticisms are exaggerated, it, they have some degree of, of validity. It's exaggerated because Bitcoin miners chase the cheapest energy. They have to do that for economic reasons. And Bitcoin mining tends to go with the energy is the least expensive, drawing a lot of idle base load as well as excess peak generation of renewable power. But I think Bitcoin miners can still do a lot better. And I encourage you in this industry to expand your use of pro-environmental energy techniques, such as capturing waste methane and using waste heat, which I know many of you are experimenting with. We environmentalists, we environmentalists will continue to pressure you to improve. However, whether or not the criticism is valid, I want to make one thing plain. The environmental argument should not be used as a smokescreen for an agenda of suppressing Bitcoin. And let me repeat that. Energy use should not be used as a pretext for an agenda of suppressing Bitcoin. Totalitarians hate anything that they can't control. And they will use any pretext necessary to control it. I am aware of an eerie parable to the COVID years when public health became a pretext to obliterate our basic rights and freedoms. The COVID public health emergency is gone now, and we must not now replace it with some new set of rationales to further the decades-long erosion of our freedoms. Finally, I'd like to clarify a couple of things. I'm not an investor and I'm not here to give investment advice or to promote Bitcoin over other cryptocurrencies or other currencies. That's the job of the free market, not the president of the United States. My interest, my interest is one, I am an ardent defender and a lifelong defender of civil liberties. And Bitcoin is both an exercise and a guarantee of those freedoms. Two, Bitcoin is a major generator of the kind of innovation our country now needs. Three, Bitcoin embodies two of my highest ideals, transparency and trust. Americans have come to distrust the government, including the way that it has manipulated our money supply to benefit the very rich and to prosecute endless wars. Bitcoin is a neutral currency beyond the ability of government or indeed any authority to manipulate. In our current system, nearly all of our transactions are transparent, all right. They're transparent to government and corporations, but their machinations and activities are not transparent to us. They are opaque. The pub public ledger of Bitcoin makes every transaction transparent to everyone. It might therefore be a harbinger of a future in which the government is transparent to the people, and that would be democracy. Now, I'm, I'm proud to make an historic announcement, but first, if you can please pull out your cell phones, our campaign will be the first presidential campaign in history to accept Bitcoin donations through, <laughs> through the Lightning Network. And today we move one step closer to the future. Today we show the world the power and the durability and the flexibility of Bitcoin. I want to conclude by saying this. Almost everyone in this room is aware of the link between Bitcoin and democracy and freedom. And that's why almost everybody I admit I, that I meet who is involved in Bitcoin is passionate about it. It's, they're not passionate because it's an interesting currency. 
They're passionate because of the deep representation of a deep need that we have for liberty and democracy. And the promise that this innovation has to guarantee those virtues. Oh, and to, we, if we are now living in this age of turnkey totalitarianism where this emerging technology which can empower totalitarian regimes. And our job is to try to build and fortify democratic institutions at the same rate as that totalitarian instruments are being expanded in their power. Things like AI, which really are gonna threaten democracy at its base. We need to not be chipping away at our democratic institutions. We need to be fortifying the ones that exist and building new ones. And the biggest, most important one on the horizon is Bitcoin because it can't be manipulated. Oh, all of you I know are here, again, not because you love a currency, but because you love our country, you love democracy, you love freedom. And in that sense, your support of Bitcoin puts you in the same category as the framers of the Constitution that gave us that Bill of Rights, that created these democratic institutions. And you are the current manifestation of that impulse. So thank you all very much for everything that you do. And thank you for being part of this movement.